So my name is Theodora Copley, and my mother was uh, Bill Copley's third wife, and so I'm the youngest of three children. And I have a half-brother and a half-sister from my father's first wife. My brother and sister and I each had our own experience of our father, and the things that I'm going to talk about in this interview are um, very much my opinion, and I just want to give the caveat that this is, I'm not speaking as an expert on Copley, but um, I mean, certainly I, I experienced him as a father and as a human being, but I think it's important for everyone who looks at his work to have their own experience of it and to come to their own conclusions about the ideas he was exploring. Um, and I certainly am not speaking for my brother and sister and I as a family here. I'm, I'm talking about some of the things that I've observed from the work and how I've related to it. My father originally started out as a writer. He started to paint as a tool to sharpen his writing. He wanted to become better at imagery in his writing. And so he thought, let's, let's just get to the painting part and make some really powerful images and then I can learn how to write about them. And I think then he realized that um, it was more fun to just paint the picture and that he could still tell really powerful stories as someone who created ideas, but he could do it with a painting instead. And I think from that moment on, you know, and then given the people he was associating with, who could mentor him as a visual artist, it must have been pretty obvious what the path should be. I was reading an interview of my father recently, and in that interview he said that he identified as a surrealist because he wanted to pay tribute to those friends and mentors of him who developed him as, uh, as an artist, as an intellectual, um, he was good friends with Magritte, Marcel Duchamp, Max Ernst, Man Ray. These were names that I heard frequently. These were people who were dearest to my father. And I think more than anything, my father was a surrealist in terms of the way he explored ridiculous images and the purpose of a ridiculous image um, to disrupt and to make people think more deeply about things. I think the way that my father played with ideas and challenged society's assumptions and moral norms and, you know, explored love, death, politics, sexuality, prostitution, militarism, was, um, was surrealist in that he, he took on some really big themes using very playful, understated ways. Humor was one of his main tools to introduce complicated topics. And personally, I think that my father's use of everyday objects in his work was another way to be funny and playful. Um, in his use of lace, for example, he was looking at a material that very much identifies femininity. Um, and then sometimes he would put buttons on images of men or their shirts, their clothing, and those buttons represent more masculinity. Um, I think, I think his use of everyday objects was mostly just to be playful and to bring the real, you know, the everyday life into the work and maybe make it more accessible for everybody. He wanted everyone to get a chance to, to appreciate his work, um, to own art. Um, and this makes me think about something he did in the late 60s, um, which was a subscription series called SMS. The project only lasted a couple of years. So SMS was a, a magazine where the subscriber would subscribe to the magazine and then four times a year they would get a cardboard box full of multiples by some of the most well-known artists of the period and some artists that weren't so well-known too. For the subscriber, they would get this, this moment of surprise to open the box and see what they got. And it was such a, um, to me, it was a fun way to bring art to everybody. I feel like one of the funniest works in the show is Feel Like a Hundred Bucks. 
And that's the big painting of the $100 bill with the mirror in the middle so that the viewer can look at the painting and see themselves in a $100 bill. I mean, it's, um, to me that's funny because uh, in the United States, the people that actually get to be on currency are, you know, the most important people in American history. And for my father to create a work where the viewer can have an interactive experience with the work and see themselves on American currency is just too funny. Um, because in, I, I think everyone has an experience with, with money and capitalism and... Um, and a, 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 an interaction with wealth and power. And the $100 bill is like um, representative of wealth, right? And, and power and to be on currency. So for him to create a way for everyone to have that interaction with wealth and power is, um, is a very disruptive idea and a very populist idea. And, and I think it's very funny as well. The Battle of the Sexes is about a dichotomy of gender, and there are some other works that, are, that similarly explore masculinity and femininity and the, the differences between the two, and I think that was something that he thought about throughout his life and certainly in his work all the time. Um, he loved women, he loved their bodies, and he loved sex, and for someone who was born in 1919, I, I think that his ability to uh, be so open or as open as he was about sexuality and to paint it was a way for him to overcome some of the more conservative values that he was brought up with both in his family and at, at the time that he lived in. So th that piece in particular I think is, um, is so interesting because there also is a tension between men and women and, and in interpersonal relationships. And I think that there's a, there's a distance and that the two characters are maintaining that distance with one sword in between them. It's like a shared struggle that they're in that, um, that they have chosen for, you know, for better or worse. One of the reasons I was excited to come to Berlin to see this show was to see the works in the private collection that are all from the same period, 1966, I think, um, that, uh, that are either part of the Ballad series or the Robert Service series. I was really enjoying looking at them because as I looked at them, I realized that every single painting has an element of humor or surprise in it uh, or something a little strange, like the woman shooting through the door with the gun at people engaged in adultery or two men in an embrace at the table. You know, this, this was 1966, and he was making very painterly um, representations of uh, these very American images, but also putting in visual humor or disrupting the status quo with what he actually was painting. Um, but, but what I also like about that series is that the color and the line in those series is, I think, just uh, so bold and creative. Um, and, and you can really see how my father's work on paper led to some of his paintings with the work in that room because um, line and pattern and repetition uh, very much reminds me of how he would use line in his drawings. And in terms of color, you can also see how, as he transferred from oils to acrylics, he was able to create um, a certain vibrancy and complexity of color by mixing the acrylic with water and then doing washes of acrylic, uneven washes to represent fabric or skin tone. Um, you know, because skin tone really has blue and red and all these other colors in it. And when he was able to layer colors with washes, he was able to make things really light up, I think. Right after his X-rated series in the early 1970s, he noticed that the conversation uh, in the United States was switching towards the centennial of the, of the nation's founding. Uh, so 1976, 200 years, he did a series that really made fun of American history and some of the things that are unquestioned. For example, the painting July 5th is a play on July 4th, which is considered a very important day 
Independence Day. But really, I think my father was trying to say, what makes July 4th any different than any other day? Maybe we should think about freedom every day.